Welcome to our series on human anatomy and physiology. This particular installment represents the last in our uh, semester one of human anatomy and physiology. On uh, chapter 15 on special senses, we will wrap up with a short discussion of gustation and take a little bit more time and look at hearing, transduction of sound, and equilibrium. Uh, here's a cartoon uh, anatomical view of the tongue. You can see there are various types of papilla. Those are the places where the, the taste sensors or taste buds are, are situated. And um, they're found on the taste receptors are found in the papilla on the tongue and the epiglottis and uh, in the soft palate. <clears throat> but mainly concentrated in the tongue. You can see the, this familiar, perhaps, map of the regions of the tongue that respond to various chemicals uh, that we perceive as being bitter, salty, sour, sweet, or umami, a savory sensation. Uh, it turns out that the sensors for each one of these different taste sensations uh, are distributed throughout the tongue, but are just concentrated to a larger degree in particular regions of the tongue, hence the taste map. But again, interestingly, only five taste sensations, which in combination with olfaction and also our perception of temperature and texture uh, is what we call uh, taste. <clears throat> well, here's a here's a um, a papilla. This is from a valley, the valley papilla. But each of the papilla contains a number of taste buds. Those are the actual sensors for gustation. So let's take a closer look at a taste bud. <coughs> Excuse me. A <coughs> taste bud has numerous gustatory hair cells, which have essentially a, a microvillus on the surface with gustatory sensors, chemical receptors, proteins in the, in the membrane, which protrude through this uh, gustatory pore, and compounds or chemicals dissolved in the saliva come in contact with these receptors on the gustatory hair cells and activate them, which in turn causes uh, action potentials in these neurons of the cranial nerves that carry taste sensation. Uh, interestingly, the, the basal cells and supporting cells that we see uh, here uh, at the base of this taste bud are actually cells that will mature into uh, gustatory hair cells or gustatory epithelial cells and replace these taste cells on a regular basis. I would remind you that the, the tongue, like the esophagus, has a stratified squamous epithelium and here we see the taste bud embedded in the layered epithelium. Uh, <clears throat> here's just a, a picture of the the neurons involved in the pathways of carrying the impulses from the uh, taste receptors to the brainstem, to the thalamus, and then finally to the gustatory cortex in the insula. So that's just a quick look at taste sensation. Um, just going back, each one of these gustatory hairs uh, on the gustatory epithelial cells contains one particular type of receptor, but then there could be multiple different hair cells within a particular taste bud that have different receptor in them. <clears throat> All right, now we shift gears and go to hearing, a really fascinating topic. And um, we'll first, of course, start out with an appreciation of some of the anatomy. And <clears throat> the outer ear is shown here. We see the aura or pinna of the ear, which we've discussed many times as we introduce the location of, of elastic cartilage in the shape of the ear. The characteristic look is because of the elastic cartilage embedded in it. And then the external auditory meatus, or acoustic meatus, is the passageway through which sound waves will travel and strike the tympanic membrane, which forms a boundary between the outer ear and middle ear. The tympanic membrane is a delicate elastic membrane which will be set to vibrating by sound waves. And as it does so, it moves these ossicles, these tiny, uh, three tiny bones, that will essentially amplify the displacement, the movement of the vibration uh, and introduce those, uh, those vibrations into the inner ear, which we see drawn here. The artist drew it kind of in a hazy uh, way in order to probably bring to your attention that these shapes that you see here are actually as hollow spaces within the temporal bone. So you're looking down into the bone there to see the cochlea, and the vestibule, and so forth of the inner ear. <clears throat> so, as the tympanic membrane moves laterally and medially and vibrates at a high frequency, um, these the malleus, incus, and stapes are these three ossicles, or ear bones, literally. And the stapes is attached to the 
vestibule of the inner ear by an elastic membrane called the oval window. Every time the stapes pushes inward, fluid will be pushed through a pathway in the cochlea and then emerge through another passageway and cause the round window to bulge outward. And every time the stapes pulls back, this is vibrating back and forth, uh, fluid will be drawn through the same passageways and the round window will dimple in and so forth, back and forth, back and forth, again at a high rate of frequency. <clears throat> you can see that the, the cochlear nerve will arise from the cochlea and we'll take a closer look and see how that's arranged and the cochlear nerve will help us appreciate sounds of different pitch and loudness. So we're going to, that's our mission is to find out how sounds are transduced and how we can appreciate pitch and loudness of those sounds. So in order to do that, we need to take a look at what is a sound wave. When a solid object vibrates, solid objects have certain frequencies that they just naturally vibrate at. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and here we see a tuning fork, a device specialized for producing vibrations of a particular frequency. And every time the tine of the tuning fork moves one moose to the right, say, it bunches up air molecules together in a more dense region. And then every time it moves to the left, it leaves behind kind of an empty space where there's fewer air molecules packed in. And it's interesting to note that as this happens, these regions of denser air packed air molecules and, and more diffuse air molecules go sailing off into space at the speed of sound, 700 something miles per hour, which is one of the great mysteries to me of physics, that whatever frequency of sound waves are produced by a vibrating object, those sound waves will travel through the atmosphere at sea level at a very specific speed. So here's a little graph showing pressure differences. What we mean by pressure is the force per unit area that will be produced when those massive air molecules strike some surface. When they're packed in close together, then a lot of air molecules are striking together. That produces a greater force, and that's what we mean by a greater air pressure. So wherever we see these densely packed air molecules, we have a higher pressure, and wherever they're more diffuse, we have a lower pressure. And if you can imagine this, this series of, of different regions traveling through the air, um, if we imagine them traveling past a certain point, um, we'll have high pressure and low pressure uh, regions traveling by. And as they do so, <clears throat> the number of those wave sort of forms that travels by a particular spot or that strikes the tympanic membrane ultimately, that's the frequency of the vibration or the sound wave given in units of hertz. So the, the sound waves are emanating off into space, uh, into air. I shouldn't say space. Space is a vacuum and there will be no sound waves. It has to be in the atmosphere, of course, because it depends on air molecules. <clears throat> okay, so the, the, this series of high pressure uh, regions and low pressure regions of air it's traveling along at the speed of sound is going to strike the tympanic membrane and displace it or move it. And as the stretchy membrane pushes towards us in this picture, you can imagine these ossicles uh, displacing also. And as the sound grows louder and louder, the tympanic membrane will be displaced to a greater degree, greater pressure, greater force per unit area by the by even more densely packed uh, air molecules. And a reflex will take place in which two muscles attached to the ossicles will begin to contract. If you can picture what happens when you touch a brass cymbal on a drum kit, if the drummer strikes the, the cymbal with his stick, you'll hear this brash sound familiar for, for cymbals. If you reach over and touch that cymbal, it'll dampen that sound out immediately. And that's why you see drummers reach out and grab the cymbals periodically as they're playing a sequence of, of rhythms to stop the vibration to start another another series. And that's what these muscles do. They dampen down the vibration and the movement of the tympanic membrane so that you can appreciate louder and louder sounds without um, running uh, afoul of the, of the mass, uh, maximum possible displacement of the tympanic membrane. So they're going to dampen things down as the sound gets louder and your, and your auditory cortex will take into account the degree to which those muscles had to be contracted to appreciate a particular sound and factor that into the notion of how loud it was. We'll come back to that. We'll summarize our discussion of loudness uh, later on. <clears throat> so here's a <clears throat> more detailed cartoon 
anatomical view of the inner ear. And we see that <clears throat> it's hollow places in the temporal bone, shaped like you can see the cochlea, the familiar shape there, and the vestibule, this large open area, and then the semicircular canals. And there's fluid in those all of those hollow spaces, wherever you see tan, that is uh, a fluid called perilymph. You also see that there are la membranous sacs, I should say, um, inserted into each of these spaces. And the membranous sacs are filled with a different fluid called endolymph. And we're going to take a look first at this membranous sac that follows its way through the, the coils of the cochlea called the cochlear duct. So the stapes you see here in this picture is pushing fluid into the, into the vestibule, which will end up traveling through a passageway in this, you know, all the coils of the cochlea and, uh, and so forth. So, uh, we want to focus on the cochlea first. We'll look at some cartoon drawings that have been designed to eliminate, for simplicity's sake, the vestibule, the semicircular canals, but don't forget that they're still present. We're just going to turn this uh, stapes right towards the cochlea so we can appreciate exactly how that organ works in transducing sound. So the cochlea is actually a coiled up package of three parallel tubes filled with fluid again. And here we have this cutaway drawing so you can see the three uh, passageways, scala vestibuli, the cochlear duct in the middle, and the scala tympani. So what we're going to do is we're going to unravel this, uh, this coil of, of three passageways. Here you can see the cross section through the scala vestibuli, one of the parallel tubes, the cochlear duct, or scala media, and then the scala tympani. Endolymph in the scala media, paralymph in the uh, outer passageways. So let's uncoil this thing a little bit and try to understand what the sound waves are doing first of all. They're actually fluid currents uh, now once, we, once the stapes introduces the vibration into the cochlea. So every time the stapes pushes inward, it pushes fluid through the scala vestibuli, and then fluid will ultimately travel then back through the scala tympani, and the round window will bulge out and every time the stapes pulls back as it's vibrating, we'll suck the fluid back through those passageways and the round window will dimple in. So we have this movement of fluid back and forth through these two passageways in the cochlea when, it's, when the tympanic membrane is vibrating. And we now have to introduce the idea of, of um, resonance. Solid materials generally have some frequencies of vibration that they naturally spontaneously enter into. I'm trying to think of a good example to give you. If you think of a stringed instrument with a wooden box behind the string, behind the sounding board, like a cello or a violin or an acoustic guitar, that box of wood is designed to have resonant frequencies, frequencies that it just loves to vibrate at, that match the, some of the frequencies of the strings when they vibrate, when they're plucked. And so that's resonance happening. It projects sound out into the, into the room because the, the whole box just begins to enter in with the vibration of the strings. If you were to fill up that box with, with sand or water, there wouldn't be any, any resonance. You wouldn't hear hardly anything coming out of that guitar. So this cochlear duct is designed in such a way <clears throat> that the basilar membrane, here's the basilar membrane of the cochlear duct here with a, with a transducing organ attached to it, but the basilar membrane uh, has different degrees of stiffness as you move from the base out to the, to the apex of the cochlear duct. And each specific spot along the cochlear duct has one frequency at which it just naturally resonates. If a vibration of a particular frequency enters into the scale of vestibuli, it will cause the cochlear duct to, to resonate, just start jumping up and down at a specific point. So here in this top drawing, we've unraveled the entire cochlea into a straight orientation, but it's normally we just take these things and twist them into a coil. All right, so the stapes is vibrating at a high frequency here, and as these movements of fluid occur, this, the cochlear duct just begins to resonate near the base. And that spot along the cochlear duct 
informs us of the pitch of sound that, that produced that vibration. A less high frequency sound, as the fluid currents are introduced into the, into the cochlea, would cause resonance to occur in a specific spot further away from the base of the cochlea. That specific spot is associated with a unique frequency of sound of a lower frequency than we saw, and finally a lower frequency in the, in the bottom diagram. So because of the, the range of resonant frequencies of the cochlear duct, our hearing ability ranges from around 20,000 hertz near the base of the cochlea and 20 to 50 hertz near the apex. The sound waves or sound frequencies we can hear are specifically because of the physical properties of the cochlear duct. It has resonant frequencies that range from 20,000 hertz down to 20 hertz. So what's happening when the cochlear duct begins to jump up and down and resonate when a particular sound wave or vibration is introduced? <clears throat> well, this is just a, a quick illustration of different frequencies. If you imagine, maybe if we, if we um, focused our eye right on the very right-hand edge of this graph and imagine the sound waves traveling at the speed of sound from left to right here, um, the red sound wave, more of those peaks would travel by in a second's time uh, of our observation than the blue, and therefore it's called a higher frequency sound, a greater number of hertz or, or uh, <clears throat> peaks per second uh, traveling by a particular spot or striking the tympanic membrane. So high frequency uh, waves or, or vibrations produce high pitch sounds in our perception, lower frequencies, low pitch sounds. So here we've expanded the transduction organ, the so-called spiral organ of corti, which is attached to the basilar membrane along the entire length of the cochlear duct. Here we've just cut through in a, in a cross section of the cochlear duct to take a close look at this organ and what its constituent parts are and how it works. So imagine now we've introduced a sound wave of a particular frequency and it's causing the basilar membrane to, to resonate or jump up and down at this particular location along the cochlear duct. <clears throat> the hair cells attached to the basilar membrane are therefore uh, jumping up and down along with it. And the tectorial membrane, this little awning-like structure over the top of the hair cells, is in a fixed position attached essentially to the, to the temporal bone. And so as the basilar membrane resonates, it's jamming those hair cells up into the tectorial membrane and these hairs, when bent or deformed, cause the hair cells to depolarize. So the, the resonance of the cochlear duct is now going to transduce the sound vibration into something that the nervous system can deal with, a depolarized cell. The depolarized hair cells will cause action potentials to occur in these uh, sensory neurons here, these bipolar neurons uh, of the, of the um, auditory nerve. Um, before we leave this diagram, we should mention something else about it. Each of those hair cells has a different sensitivity, meaning a different degree of deflection, a different degree of contact with the tectorial membrane is required to activate it. Some hair cells may be very, very sensitive and slight degrees of resonance would cause its depolarization. Other hair cells might be much less sensitive and require a much more vigorous um, resonance to get anything to happen. So the number of hair cells reporting or depolarizing at a particular spot on the cochlear duct helps us appreciate the loudness of sound. If all the hair cells at once are, are depolarizing, we know it's a very loud sound. It's really moving the, the, the basilar membrane to a large degree, a large amount of displacement, whereas if only one or two hair cells in this diagram are activated, why then? That would be a more quiet sound. The basilar membrane is displaced to a lesser degree, and only the most sensitive hair cells are being transduced or transducing the stimulus. So pretty cool. So here's just an illustration in terms of uh, air pressure again. That uh, the difference between a loud and a softer sound. A softer sound has the the, the packets or regions of of high uh, pressure air are less dense than the regions in a louder sound where the where there's a lot more air pressure so that there's a lot more force on displacing the tympanic membrane, the stapes, and causing the basilar membrane to move to a larger 
degree longer distance as it resonates and get a louder sound, more hair cells are activated. But once again, don't forget that as the tympanic membrane begins to displace and the ossicles to a larger and larger degree, larger and larger distance, the stapedius muscle over here, the tensor tympani muscle, will begin to contract and dampen down those movements so that we can appreciate a much wider dynamic range or range of loudnesses of sound uh, that our ears can handle. <clears throat> There's a little cool micrograph showing some hair cells in the cochlea in the spiral organ of corti, inner and outer hair cells. And here's some actual hairs uh, shown here in a, in a, a transmission or a stereo. Uh, what am I saying? It's a, a scanning electron micrograph. And so the, the spiral organ is where the transduction occurs. We're going to activate these um, bipolar cells. You see the spiral ganglion here. Right? We have a collection of the, of the cell bodies of the, of the bipolar cells, and therefore it's called a ganglion. And then those carry their impulses to the brain stem and finally to the thalamus, ultimately into the auditory cortex and the temporal lobe. That's the primary auditory cortex, and then we have the auditory association cortex to make sense of all these vibrations that we hear. <clears throat> well, unfortunately, there are a number of situations or potential problems that reduce the degree to which sound waves are transduced, deafness. And the first stage in, a, in clinical evaluation and diagnosis of deafness and its causes is to differentiate between conductive deafness and sensorineural deafness. Conduction deafness means that there's something interfering with the introduction of the vibration induced by the sound waves to the inner ear. So the outer ear and middle ear are just physically vibrating structures that introduce that vibration to the inner ear. If anything goes wrong in that category, in that part of the ear, we have conduction deafness or conductive deafness. If there's impaction of cerumen or some other debris in the external auditory meatus, we'll have conductive deafness. The sound waves will be dampened out before they ever even reach the tympanic membrane. If the ossicles have been exposed to inflammation serially over and over, they may begin to scar. After we have inflammation, we have healing, and sometimes we have scarring, as you know. In many of our discussions, so if the ossicles become scarred or sclerosed, then they won't move freely, and so we won't be able to introduce the sound with as much faithfulness into the inner ear as before the conductive deafness. The tympanic membrane itself may have a hole or be destroyed by an excessive force placed on it, and again, we'll have conductive deafness. If, on the other hand, the transducing equipment, the spiral organ in the cochlea, uh, the hair cells are no longer uh, responding to the displacement of the basilar membrane and then striking the tectorial membrane, the hair cells die off with age. Or they tend to die off when exposed to very, very loud sounds. Uh, so the, if the hair cells are dying, we have less ability to transduce sounds and we begin to have what's called sensorineural deafness. Sensorineural deafness category also includes all of the, the entire pathway to the auditory cortex and the auditory cortex itself. Anything to do with the nervous system's ability to appreciate the, the, the impulses that are derived from transduction of sound waves, that's part of the sensorineural system and we have sensorineural deafness. And there's a couple of tests that we did in lab to, to just initially differentiate between those categories, uh, the Weber test and the Rhine test, and you can look back in your lab manual, manual to check on those. Um, another problem with, with uh, hearing, potentially, tinnitus or tinnitus. Whenever you have a perception of sound, but there's no actual stimulus to explain it, uh, that's called tinnitus. And it's a, a real problem for many, many people. Uh, they have a very distracting perception of sound coming from the, from the ears and, uh, and, and, and as if they're listening to a loud sound all the time. Imagine how much nicer it is to concentrate when you have quiet all around you and just imagine a situation where it's never quiet. You just always have this perception of sound that's tinnitus or tinnitus. Meniere syndrome is a, uh, or disease is a situation where there are episodes 
periodic episodes of violent dizziness, well, I should use the word vertigo because that's a more accurate term, a spinning sensation. And <clears throat> that can cause nausea, as we'll look in a second at some of the, uh, the nervous system centers that appreciate uh, different um, stimuli coming from the inner ear. Um, that may produce nausea and vomiting during these periods of vertigo and also deafness. So what, what's thought to happen is, you think back to those blue sacs and passageways you saw in the inner ear filled with endolymph. The endolymph volume apparently rises abnormal, abnormally, <coughs> interfering with the normal function of the uh, organs in which it's found. And so if the, if the cochlear duct is expanding in volume, it's going to interfere with the spiral organ's ability to transduce sound. We're going to start having some deafness in the ear. It may even cause the, the uh, cochlear duct to burst in the mixing of the endolymph and paralymph, these two very different uh, solutions, and, and cause deafness. Um, if the semicircular canals are interfered with in this way by one ear, typically that, that's, uh, that's um, penetrated by this Meniere's disease, then you'll have problems with balance and the spinning sensation and the nausea associated with the nerve syndrome. So kind of a terrible thing. Um, eventually it leads to some degree at least of permanent deafness, but there's these episodes of, of vertigo and, and deafness. All right, so that's our, our conclusion of our discussion of sound transduction. And now let's take a look at the other part of the inner ear, the vestibule and two sacs, two endolymph fluid filled sacs that we see there called the saccule and the utricle, and also the semicircular canals, three orthogonally oriented um, passageways, half circle passageways, in other words, that are at three right angles. So in every plane of the Cartesian coordinates, there's a, there's a, um, there's a semicircular canal. It's kind of hard for authors to get that across in a two-dimensional drawing like this, and they've done admirably. If you look at the purple structures, there are two sensors of equilibrium, it's called, which we're going to take a look at right now and see what their functions are here in the vestibule and the semicircular canals of the inner ear. So this, first of all, the macula. A macule is one of these purple um, regions you see drawn into the saccule and utricle. And here's a macule oriented in the horizontal plane. And there is an epithelium interspersed with sensory hair cells, a patch of sensory cells with these stereocilia and kinocilium, which when this deformed or bent, uh, produce action potentials more or fewer in these, uh, in these uh, neurons of the vestibular nerve. Balanced on top of all these, of all these uh, sensory hairs, these cilia, is a flat slab of the otolith membrane. It's like a gelatinous material balanced like a flat rock on a, on a hairbrush uh, <clears throat> on top of these hair cells. And then piled up on that otolith membrane is a pile of rocks, literally ear stones. Otolith just means literally ear stones. And they are heavy. And they're, they're balanced right on top of that uh, of that patch of hairs when it's horizontal. When the macula is horizontal, it's balanced. And then if you tip your head, then that heavy otolith membrane with all the otoliths piled on top will then be dragged down by gravity and deform those hair cells, uh, the hairs of the hair cells, and create some transduction, some impulses in the vestibular nerve. Let's take a look at what I mean by that. Here's a macula in the horizontal position, and there is tonic activity in the, in, the, in the neurons attached to those hair cells. If we tip the head one way, it'll cause depolarization of the, of the stereo and kinocilium, and that'll cause an increase in the frequency of action potentials. Or if we tilt the, tilt the head the opposite way, it'll cause hyperpolarization and a reduction in the frequency of, of impulses. And so, by the action of these macula, you can appreciate the position of your head, and therefore, of course, your body. So that's called static equilibrium, not moving equilibrium. What's the position of your body 
or your head. There are two perpendicularly arranged uh, maculas so that whether you're lying down or standing up, it doesn't matter. You can still appreciate the position of your head. Another thing that the uh, macula uh, do for you is they provide an appreciation of linear acceleration. Acceleration means to change velocity. So imagine you're standing still and your macula is in the horizontal position, one particular macula, and then you begin to move your body through space. You decide to walk along and the otolith membrane has inertial mass. Newton's laws of motion, one of the laws says that objects at rest tend to remain at rest. That means it takes a lot of force to get a stationary object to start moving. And so when you begin walking, the otolith membrane lags behind and deforms these, again, these kinocilia and produces an appreciation by way of changed uh, action potential frequency. And then when you're walking along and you start to slow down, then objects in, mo in motion tend to remain in motion. That's the other part of that uh, Newton's law. There's, there's momentum of this heavy otolith membrane in all of its rocks, and so it tends to keep on going and deforms those hair cells in the opposite direction. So changing speed, speeding up or slowing down uh, in a straight line is what the macula can help us appreciate, linear acceleration. All right, let's look at another sensor, the crista ampullaris. There's a crista ampullaris organ found in each of the semicircular canals. You can see these bulgy regions. And inside that bulge region <clears throat> is a little gelatinous dam called a cupula. And the fluid in the semicircular canal, if it flows through, will strike this cupula. It's very wispy and just cause it to bend over. And as it bends, it deforms some kinocilia and stereocilia, again, on some hair cells embedded in this crista ampullaris organ. So what's going to happen? When you turn your head, the fluid in the semicircular canal, the one that's the most ideally oriented to appreciate this movement, has inertial mass, just like the, uh, the otolith membrane, and it doesn't move. So when you turn your head to the side, the fluid in the semicircular canal remains stationary and effectively flows across one of the cupula, deforms it, and allows you to realize that you've turned your head. That's called angular acceleration or rotational motion. So that's what these uh, crista ampullaris allows to appreciate is angular acceleration, turning, rotating in space. And there's three different semicircular canals in different planes, so no matter in what plane your body is rotating, your head is rotating, you can appreciate that, uh, the acceleration through the action of these, uh, of these organs. So that's pretty cool. The crista ampullaris. And there's a little uh, scanning electron micrograph of the crista ampullaris, uh, or at least the cupula in the crista, amp crista ampullaris. <clears throat> so again, as you spin one way, as you start to spin, the fluid flows effectively in the opposite direction by not moving along with your body and striking the cupula, deforming it, and, and, and activating or depolarizing these hair cells and producing uh, action potentials or changes in action potentials in the, in the, in the neurons of the um, vestibular nerve and so forth. Um, one interesting point I learned about in teaching this course is that um, ballet dancers avoid the problem of repeated spinning. If you're rotating a semicircular canal often enough or, or for a long enough period of time, the fluid will begin to move. And then when you finish rotating and stop, the fluid then has inertial mass and it will continue rotating and produce an, an erroneous perception of body rotation or head rotation, which we call dizziness. That's why I wanted to differentiate that term dizzy from vertigo in the previous um, discussion. So um, ballet dancers tend to spot, meaning they try to keep their head from rotating as long as possible as their body is rotating by staring at one point in space. And then as, they, as the head can no longer um, continue to look at that spot, they'll snap it around and then catch a look at that spot again every time the body rotates or the head you know, the body rotates that's called spotting and so that they don't produce that movement of fluid in the in the semicircular canal whereas um, I think it's fascinating that um, figure skaters spin so fast for so long in the in the typical traditional um, routines that they skate that the fluid will begin to move 
and when they stop spinning, will continue to move and produce this erroneous perception of rotation, and they have simply had to train themselves through the plasticity, the amazing plasticity of the nervous system to ignore those signals and skate straight. I think that's a fascinating uh, example of, of, of some of the complexity of your nervous system. All right, so here we see a wonderful diagram showing some of the um, arrangement of different sensory apparatus that impact the vestibular nuclei in the cerebellum. We know the cerebellum keeps track of all the proprioceptor activity, so we know the position and movement of all the joints in your body. Well, it also receives input from the vestibular sensors, <clears throat> and the vestibular nuclei receive those inputs from the vestibular sensors and so forth, but they also receive uh, the inputs from the eyes. The retinas are telling them what the field of view is doing. We have these sensors in the ear that are telling us what's happening with motion of the body, and the eyes are looking out onto the horizon and telling us what's happening with the motion of the body. And then we have, of course, proprioceptors, which are explaining or, or recording movements of all the muscles and tendons and joints. <clears throat> and all these things are integrated in the vestibular nuclei and the cerebellum. Excuse me. If there happens to be a conflict, interestingly, between the data from these different sources, there's going to be a little problem. So, for example, if you are um, in the car, reading a book, or staring at the map, as far as your visual perception, you're not moving at all. That book is perfectly stationary. You're reading it just so like you'd read it if you're sitting in the living room in your favorite uh, comfy chair. But yet, the vestibular sensor is saying, oh no, the car is going over bumps and, and going through turns in the road and so forth. We're moving all over the place, or it might be on a DC, deep sea fishing vessel or a whale watching vessel. The body, these sensors are saying, no, we're actually moving. And that conflict between these types of inputs will uh, cause a sensation of nausea. So what we call motion sickness arises from this conflict of data coming to the vestibular, vestibular nuclei and parts of the brainstem. And you can circumvent that problem by taking a nervous system depressant and just slightly depressing the activity of the vestibular nuclei in various integration centers so that the nausea isn't the response to the conflict of data. Incidentally, you have to take those drugs like Dramamine before you experience the, the, the nausea associated with motion sickness. If you wait until you already don't feel well, it's a little bit too late and you will probably experience the entire episode of nausea anyway. Uh, three cochlear nerves, or three cranial nerves, are involved in <clears throat> this, these, these perceptions of, of hearing and uh, sound and, uh, I'm sorry, um, vestibular sensation are listed here. I guess the, uh, oh, these are the, the eye movement, I'm sorry, these are the reflex eye movements in response to the changes in the vestibular apparatus. Uh, we did a test in lab to demonstrate a reflex activity of the, of the eyes when you cause someone to become dizzy, in other words, spin them for a long time and then suddenly stop them, and that fluid is continuing to move in the semicircular canal, we saw that the, these muscles, uh, these cranial nerves will activate the muscles of the eyes and cause the, the uh, eyes to cycle back and forth in the orbits. Um, so, very interesting. <clears throat> All right, so that's our story of special senses, a wrap-up of Chapter 15 of our, uh, of our Human Anatomy and Physiology text. I hope you've enjoyed this series. Uh, tune in. Uh, next time for the beginning of the second half of anatomy and physiology in which we entertain the endocrine system, the hormones. And I'm sure you'll be fascinated to learn more about uh, some topic that you already know a fair amount about probably from various uh, educational experiences in your life.